Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining this conversation about teaching and chat GPT. And perhaps more broadly, we might find ourselves in a conversation about artificial intelligence tools in the classroom. My name is Amanda Irvin, and I am the Senior Director of Faculty Programs and Services at the Center for Teaching and Learning. I'll be moderating today's forum, and I'm honored to be joined by colleagues who I will introduce in just a moment. They have graciously agreed to contribute to today's forum and help us ground and contextualize our conversation. Briefly, since I'll leave a more nuanced explanation to our computer science colleagues, and I strongly encourage them to correct me if I get anything wrong here, ChatGPT is a free open access artificial intelligence powered chatbot developed by a company called OpenAI. It's extremely powerful and can engage in human-like dialogue or generate human-like responses based on a prompt or question. Some of you may have been following the development and media coverage of ChatGPT since its announcement in the fall. Others joining us today may have only heard about it in the last few weeks or even days. Either way, since this is a quickly developing conversation, there's a, a lot to know and learn about ChatGPT. One thing to highlight about these discussions, especially for our purposes today, is that while many articles about the tool raise concerns about ChatGPT and academic integrity, there's also a strong consensus that AI presents us with an exciting opportunity to explore creative ways to leverage it as a tool in teaching and learning. I imagine we will discuss some of those creative ways together today. So without further ado, let's begin. Our conversation today will include brief openings from our contributors and then a Q&A. Thank you to all of you who have sent questions in advance of today's forum. We have already added them to the queue. If you didn't have a chance to submit a question in advance, don't worry. You can submit one anytime today using the Q&A feature in Zoom, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. Our first contributors will be Kathy McEwen, Gertrude, Henry and Gertrude Rothschild Professor of Computer Science and Founding Director of Columbia's Data Science Institute, and Melanie Sabaya, a PhD student in computer science and a lead author on the GPT-3 paper, which was ChatGPT's predecessor. They will share more information about what GPT, ChatGPT is and what it can do and what it can't do yet, and will offer some insight into the ongoing conversation about what the future might hold for engaging students with these tools in our classes. Next, we'll hear from Nicole Wallach, Director of the Undergraduate Writing Program and Senior Lecturer in the Discipline of English and Comparative Literature, who will share how writing instructors are approaching ChatGPT as they consider its potential in the writing classroom. And finally, Victoria Mullaney Brown, Director of Academic Integrity, will offer some insight into how one might consider ChatGPT in terms of academic integrity, including some resources and opportunities for further discussion. We will field questions once all of our contributors have shared, but you don't have to wait until the end to submit a question. You can submit one at any time and we will do our best to answer as many as possible. It will be, I am sure, a rich and engaging conversation. So Kathy, Kathy and Melanie, I will now turn it over to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay, thanks, Amanda. So as Amanda said, ChatGPT is an advanced AI chatbot, which was re released this last November. It generates very fluent text, and it also solves a wide range of problems. You interact with it through conversation, um, specifically by giving a prompt. Um, and it learns every day from your feedback, so it's improving all of the time. Um, it's a machine learning uh, based approach, and it uses what's called language, large language modeling, which given a sequence of words will predict the next word that has the highest probability to follow next. So given the string, the cat sat on a map, the next most likely word would be Matt, I already said it. <laughs> Um, and it learns from human feedback. So uh, given um, two responses to the same um, prompt, uh, a human preference for which one is better will also be used for its learning. It uses a massive data set of online text for training and it's built on a huge transformer model. Uh, so here's an example. Um, on the top part is the prompt, and on the bottom part is the generated output. 
The prompt includes an instruction, summarize this article in two sentences, and I've also given it a news article from the New York Times. Um, the generated summary uses content from the red, and it does some interesting things. For example, it uses a generalization conspiracy theories to refer to the puppet masters. So this is a dramatic improvement um, in what was possible even six months ago. Uh, but it also hallucinates. So there's nowhere in the input that it tells us uh, that people can't afford these luxury items. In our work at Columbia, uh, we've done research that shows that summaries generated by large language models for news are judged by humans to be um, as good as summaries written by people. Um, but as we go to other genres, uh, summarization is more problematic and there will be more hallucinations. It also does open-ended generation. So given the prompt, describe what happened on January 6th in two paragraphs, we get a very nice response, which gives us a lot of detail about the events of the day. Uh, but when we get to the end, this part in yellow, um, we get a lie. Uh, so it does tell us that Donald Trump was impeached twice, that is correct, uh, but then it tells us he was later convicted by the Senate, that is not true. Um, it is a research focus in NLP um, for creating methods to avoid hallucination and enforce truthfulness, so this will be improving. Um, there is some interesting research done at Columbia, which people might like to take a look at, on um, how language models can support creative writers. So PhD student Katie Giro did research uh, with three, with user studies on three tasks, evaluating um, how language models are useful for uh, creative writers. First, generating metaphors for poets generating ideas for scientific writers that they could use when they wanna make their research accessible to the public, generating follow-on phrases or sentences for novelists who are in the middle of writing a story. She has many results, uh, just a, a hint of what they are. She found that six out of nine study participants in the scientific writing task found the generated ideas useful. They provided inspiration. They provided um, information about how to articulate ideas in a concise way. And they provided a perspective that the author had not talk, thought of. Melanie? Thank you, Kathy. So uh, language models like ChatGPT also memorize a lot of facts about the world from their training data, but importantly, they've only seen what is actually in their training data. So in ChatGPT's case, the data um, cuts off at 2021. So right now I can't answer contemporary questions about 2020, 2022 and 2023. So in this case, if you ask who is the president, it acknowledges that um, its data cuts off in 2021 and gives the, the most recent answer that it was aware of. It, so uh, it also is useful to provide uh, ideas around um, research topics that you might want to follow up on, but it often provides incorrect references that seem plausible. So in this case, I was asking um, to learn more about antigen design and vaccine development, and it provided this uh, very realistic list of papers. But when I went to search this, I can't find any record of this paper actually existing. And it seems like the first author in this case actually publishes more in environmental conservation. Next. And the wording of how you interact with ChatGPT can affect the results that you get back, particularly in relation to math and um, quantity manipulation. So in this case, um, in both cases, I'm asking essentially the same math question, which is, is seven plus two greater than or equal, uh, greater than or less than eight? But I phrase it as two different word problems. And in the first case, the model responds incorrectly, um, whereas in the second case, it responds correctly and has useful mathematical reasoning. Next. 
And finally, uh, people have looked at how chat, chat GPT can perform on um, different professional assessments that we have. So in medical law and business domain, as well as Columbia faculty who've looked at um, math problems, machine learning exams, and programming assignments within our own classes here. And um, in general, ChatGPT is able to, to get passing grades to be pretty successful on these assessments. So it's definitely able to answer questions that students are thinking about in courses. Next. And finally, we're all interested in, yeah, like, can we detect if students are using assignments? Um, is there a way to sort of uh, regulate how that is being used? And currently, it's extremely hard to detect. So OpenAI, the company who made ChatGPT, released um, their own detector, which was only able to catch a quarter of AI written text, so very unreliable. And models are continually improving, as Kathy mentioned. So any detector that works one day may not work the next day. Um, so it's likely that we're going to have to focus on um, ways to work in conjunction with this technology. So alongside this forum today, um, there's also a link here to OpenAI's resource for educators, which they're continuing to build on. And um, they also have a feedback form there to um, try and collect insights from educators um, if there's things that are working particularly well in your classroom or in relation to academic integrity, or if you have general um, feedback and concerns. Thank you. Melanie and Kathy, thank you both so much. Um, so we will now transition to Nicole Wallach, who will share some insights into how instructors of writing are thinking about chat GPT and the ongoing conversation there. Nicole, please. Thanks, Amanda. And thank you, Kathy and Melanie, for the wonderful presentation, a very helpful uh, precursor to what I'm offering here just briefly. Uh, so um, I want to just give you a sense of the general um, nature of the discussion that's happening among writing instructors, writing program administrators, writing center consultants and directors uh, regarding this new technology. Uh, so the, the first question for us always is what, what is the nature of the conversation right now? And as you might know, know already, it's mixed. Um, but one of the things that's helping us to really do uh, in writing programs and beyond is to say, what do we think writing instruction is for and what should it focus on? So part of the conversation that's happening right now is that it's amplifying debates about content orientations in writing courses, uh, not versus always, not totally at odds with one another, but in terms of emphasis, um, in relationship to process uh, orientations. That means, should we be more focused on the, the product that students are writing in our courses, or should we be more concerned with how they get to writing the work that they're doing in our classes? As might also be expected, um, uh, this technology raises already existing concerns about increases in linguistic um, bias. And what does that mean for questions of racial justice in terms of how we as writers and our students express ourselves on the page? Um, the third thing that this new AI is uh, really getting us to think about is uh, what our approaches need to be in terms of assessment of writing. What are we grading? Uh, what it counts as meaningful feedback, uh, what does it tell us about even the questions of revision? So what, what might count as revision? And to not have everything, everything be bleak, um, it's also generating a lot of excitement about how the AI will prompt new ideas about writing and composing more broadly in academic contexts. And so we look forward uh, to that. Um, I want to just give you a sense of a couple of things from university writing, which is the first year essay writing course that we teach here at Columbia as part of the core curriculum. And my colleague, Glenn Michael Gordon, who is an assistant director of the program, along with the rest of us, we're, we're working with uh, ChatGPT to see what it would yield. And we were hoping that it would do really badly, I have to say. We hoped it would fail and that would make us feel like um, we had nothing to be concerned about at some level, which is always an okay place to start. 
Um, so here is a typical question that we might ask as an exercise, a writing exercise in university writing. And uh, for folks uh, who might need it, I'm looking at a slide and it says um, at the top uh, a comment, uh, a title that says an exercise prompt given to ChatGPT. And the, the, the uh, text here reads, pick five interesting quotations from Kathy Park Hong's essay, Bad English, and cite the page in MLA style. After each quote, state why it's interesting in relationship to her whole essay. And of the five or six of the five answers it gave, it does know how to count. Um, it gave us three quotations and it gave three responses. I won't read each of them, but one of the things that we noted is that uh, like any, I'll say, early learner of working with quotations, it knows how to repeat the language of the quotation pretty much verbatim as a form or a gesture of analysis, rather than potentially moving on to more um, close reading or um, subtle analysis of linguistically uh, what's going on in the passage. Tellingly, as you give it more and more quotations to work with, it does more and more sophisticated readings uh, of them. Here is the essay prompt that uh, my colleague Glenn Gordon gave to uh, ChatGPT. This is uh, part of what the final essay would look like in, in university writing and university writing students and instructors will will recognize this prompt, uh, write a 1200 word essay using MLA citation that offers an insightful new way to understand Valeria Luiselli's essay, Tell Me How It Ends. And again, uh, it we gave it several different op opportunities to work with this prompt. And in fact, when it came up with a um, an answer, um, much of this material we could not find elsewhere on the web. Uh, so it wasn't that it was um, entirely repeating material that was on the web. Um, and especially Glenn was uh, talking to us about how this phrase in the second paragraph, this concept of narrative power seems to be uh, a new way of talking about Lewis Sally's work. That is, it didn't appear in reviews, it didn't appear, and it's theorized. It's not just a, a, a phrase, it's, a, it's an idea that's offered. I wanna think about how this development in, in ChatGBT is highlighting some durable findings that we already have had for 60 years in the field of writing studies and of course in cognitive psychology as well which is about how, what does it mean to become a writer or to learn what it means to write, especially in academic contexts. And here is just a little bit from the um, uh, cognitive psychologist um, researcher, Ronald Kellogg, who this is a piece from 2008, but he has continued to write on these themes where he reminds us, and this is a picture of Ronald Kellogg um, and a short quotation uh, from him where he says, it takes at least two decades of maturation, instruction, and training to advance from one, the beginner's stage of using writing to tell what it knows, to two, the intermediate stage of transforming what one knows for the author's benefit, and three, to the final stage of crafting what one knows for the reader's benefit. One of the things that uh, ChatGPT is demonstrating to us is, in fact, that it can do some leapfrogging over these stages itself, but I would say that it's pretty much still in uh, the beginner stage, that it's using writing to say what it knows. And as we've heard uh, previously, um, it knows what it's fed. I think we have some questions that we have to answer for now. Some of these are questions that we need to answer individually and some that we need to answer collectively. Here are mine. What are the roles of writing in your courses? And by roles of writing, I mean, what is the work that writing does in your course? Can you, can you talk about that as a student or as a faculty member? These roles might be, it might have informal roles, formal ones, it might have collaborative roles, might have individual roles. How can students help experience writing? How can we help students experience writing as a technology for thinking? 
rather than always and only the product of that thinking. Third, how do we foster knowledge and skills transfer in our classes and across them? Meaning, what are the things that we do in any course that gives students uh, things that they know how to bring to novel occasions of learning in the future? I would argue that uh, ChatGPT at the moment is not, does not provide us with those opportunities as readily. And finally, what metacognitive practices can we introduce to students to increase transfer and agency in their learning? Metacognition and working on developing metacognitive skills is one of the things that we can do most fruitfully and collaboratively in class time to change the roles that writing plays for us uh, in our work. Those are questions that we can answer uh, individually. Here are some questions now that I think we need to answer collectively or certainly in larger uh, groups. How can we describe the principles and values that inform the writing we do in our discipline or in our department or in any other collective that you want to name? What standards inform the assessment criteria we use for student writing or composing? What practices or processes of reading and writing do we expect students to just know and which do we teach? And finally, how can in-class writing support the learning goals in your course? I'm gonna actually stop here, not because I, I now can launch into uh, answers to all of them, but because I think that these are questions that are going to be live and that we in the undergraduate writing program and the writing center are delighted to work on with our colleagues across departments here at Columbia. Thanks. Well, thank you so much. I will now turn it over to our final contributor, Victoria Malini Brown, Director of Academic Integrity. Victoria, please. Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me okay. I'm just going to maximize my screen here. All right. So it's nice to be with you this afternoon. I just want to say thanks to the panelists and for the Center for Teaching and Learning for to for inviting me. Um, and I wanted to start with just kind of some context setting, uh, and I wanted to kind of bring to the conversation this piece around, you know, new technology, new teaching methods, right? Because I wanted to start by framing the conversation that, you know, this is not the first time that academia as a whole has had a kind of reckoning with tech and how it has created um, what I would like to call kind of a disruption of kind of how we're teaching. And it's forcing us to think about and what ways can we teach? What pedagogy are we using? And in what ways should we be thinking about involving technology in the classroom? And so one easy thing that I just wanna point all of our attention to is just like the onset of the internet, right? In the 1990s, 2000s, it's gotten even better. And arguably even to today, when the internet was created, like that was a huge shape shift in kind of how folks were thinking, how education was being used, what you could find on the internet. And even today, that is a big part of the learning process and a tool that we use constantly um, to be able to enhance our learning, to think about ways that we can find information, but with the caveat that the internet isn't everything. You have to have a, a good um, filter and a good sense of judgment of what is good content and what isn't good content. And so I kind of wanted to start with that because it might seem like obvious, but I also just want to remind the hysteria that I've heard um, since the start of the fall and, and now into the uh, ongoing spring, that there's a lot of fear. And I just wanted to acknowledge that from the teaching and academic integrity side of like, what do we do now? And there's a lot of this, these questions about it, right? So I just wanted to say we've, we've been there, we've done that, but we need to continue to evolve. And so I also wanted to bring in a couple of different contributors and, and names, um, a couple of pieces of articles. You know, if you, if you just Google ChatGPT, of course, you're going to get the actual program, but you're also going to see lots and lots of articles written about this. Um, and so it's just one of the technological curveballs that higher education as a field and an industry has had to deal with, right? And it's even prompted K-12 school districts, including our own here, right here in New York, um, to ban the using of ChatGPT from Wi-Fi networks, which I found was super interesting. And that's been um, a bit of a controversy on our end, thinking about the integrity and about the learning process. Um, there's, there's kind of two approaches to kind of uh, the thought. And so 
Um, what I also want to share is a couple more thoughts here on you know what my other panelists have said around that the reactions to this this program and this technology has been mixed. I think the two biggest camps that you'll see in kind of the articles and also for folks that do integrity based work um, day in and day out is this tension between policing versus ethical use in the classroom. Um, there's a lot of a, an acknowledgement of you know understanding that our instructors are even our own students who are learning in the classroom they don't want to be policed on like you know whether they're being thought to be cheating because they're using technology but i'm more of, um in the camp of propo proponent of using this ethically right as our other contributors kathy and um has mentioned like you know this tech isn't going anywhere um and we need to think about ways to ethically allow students to use it and so i think that would probably be the best approach to take um a lot of other concerns that i've heard initially not just from the columbia community but at broad of other uh, academic integrity consortiums and groups of people that you know consult on this topic as things evolve is uh you know, concerns a lot from what Nicole was mentioning on the writing space and kind of how will students use this. Um, but I think overall, what we're hearing is that there is an appreciation um, for technological advances, but many of us are still kind of cautious and um, curious about how it will be proactively used in the classrooms. And there are some universities that are actually proceeding and using ChatGPT as a tool with an abundance of caution. I think it's important though to remind ourselves that even in the classroom, what is the standards that we want to set for using a tool like ChatGPT? And in what ways do we want to completely limit it? I mean, there are some resources and tips that I also want to add. And I have some larger questions and I saw in the chat some things that have come out with like, you know, how do we understand students' intentions? And so I think it's really important as if you're an instructor or you're in a teaching role to be able to take a look at a good sense of how you're teaching about the learning outcomes and what are you asking students to do for assignments. The International Center for Academic Integrity is a great resource. It's, it's a website called academicintegrity.org. They host a myriad of webinars. They have a conference coming up um, just next month. And at Columbia, we're affiliated member with this organization. And I would encourage if you have further conversations wanting to talk about academic integrity, that's a great one to consider. Um, I also really like what Dr. Sarah Eaton is doing at the University of Calgary. She's kind of one of the up and coming academic integrity researchers in the field of higher education. And she's kind of challenged us to think about some of these concepts on um, academic integrity in, in a broader way. And so I like this visual that um, she shares and I'm, I'm just trying to pull it up here. Um, and so this visual where she's talking about using artificial intelligence for schoolwork doesn't automatically equate to misconduct. So I want folks to think about that, that it depends on context and kind of the policy. And so that gets back to my like, perception as someone who looks at cases all the time and kind of sees where students intentions were or you know a miscon misconceptions of an assignment that you have to be really clear as an instructor about what you want your students to use and a lot of times this would come up under an authorized collaboration in our policy at Columbia um I agree with Sarah that artificial intelligence can be used ethically for teaching learning and assessment and I think that's where the that conversation really needs to go next um but banning the use of artificial intelligence in schools it's it's really hard to do and i think you know that is another question that you have to wrestle with and so there are other districts at the k-12 level who have done that and that's something to think about i'm not sure i'm on that that camp either about banning any of the tools i think it's about teaching our young adults kind of how to use this and in what way um the other parts that she mentions around, you know, human imagination and creativity, you know, we as human beings create, you get created tools like ChatGPT and others. And so, you know, we can't eliminate necessarily our own um, creativity and imagination in the, thought, in the thoughtful way that we teach and the way we learn. Um, 
assessment wise, which is what often comes up in the cases of academic integrity or dishonesty, is like what assessments did that student um, take shortcuts on and, and what as the instructor are you looking at? Does that violate potentially our policy? Um, so that also should be important and align with what she's suggesting as the learning outcomes of your course. Um, and I agree, learn, you know, artificial intelligence is not going anywhere. In fact, it's only getting better and we have to work with the technology, not against it. Um, and so I think that's some of my part around tips is, you know, talk about chat GPT in the classroom, um, acknowledging it. We know students are always on top of new trends. And so if you're someone who are able to kind of acknowledge it, have a conversation proactively and make your stance clear about how you want it being used or not used, that's totally your right as an instructor to put those boundaries in place. Um, as far as policy, there's lots and lots of different pieces that I just wanna kind of round out my um, contribution today and I'm happy to take more questions. Um, you know, there's lots of conversations now about the policy. So what is Columbia's academic misconduct policy? Um, what does it include? How does it actually acknowledge artificial intelligence generators, or, which is the language that we would likely um, include? And so there's always, um, every time, every year, there's an audit and a review of our policy. And so that's coming down the pike. Um, and you know, there are other tools that have popped up as far as in reaction to using ChatGPT and GPT-0, which I have a question mark next to, is one that was quickly developed by a Princeton senior, um, Edward uh, Tian. And so there were lots of folks interested in kind of thinking out, how do I use that in tandem with checking to see if a student has generated something artificially? And so like other pieces that our contributors have said, like, no tool is 100% perfect and we shouldn't necessarily rely on what these tools are saying as a as the be all end all of whether a student has potentially violated a policy i think your discretion as a faculty member is still very very important and reporting still very much matters as far as for the university to take action and kind of investigate what's happening um, and for, for students, I think it's really important to acknowledge to them um, why, you know, why it's important to give them their, give them trust, but also challenge them in a good way. If they still are coming to you for ways to kind of enhance their learning, supplement the concepts, gain greater clarity on what you're teaching them, that um, as an instructor, you should also include the right resources that you want students to use, because if that's not clear, they're going to use the internet, they're going to talk to peers, they're going to find other web mechanisms to supplement learning that they don't feel like they have a good sense about. So I wanted to um, kind of conclude with that. And then lastly, um, before I go, I really was grateful to be a part of this conversation today because I wanted us to draw our attention to Integrity Week, which is actually coming up at Columbia at the end of this month. And what Integrity Week is, it, it's a week at Columbia that facilitates really integral conversations such as these with our campus community about ethics, integrity, and um, why through programming workshops that center these fundamental values of academic integrity in our research, teaching, and learning. And it's a week of collective action that I invite you personally to attend. And you can find out more on my website, which we'll throw in the chat as well. Um, cccs.columbia.edu slash integrity week. And there's a multitude of programs for faculty, graduate students, postdocs, our undergraduates, and you are all welcome to attend. So I invite you to uh, continue the conversation. Um, thank you. Victoria, thank you so much. And thank you to all of our contributors for everything that they've shared with us. It's, a lot to think about, and I know that you're all thinking about it because we've received many questions throughout all of these uh, presentations. So I'd encourage all of our contributors to turn on their camera. We'll move to the Q&A portion uh, of our time together now, and we will try and answer as many of these questions as possible. Um, I think, you know, we have quite a few, they're, they're sort of coming in and there are certain themes that seem to be across all of the questions that we're seeing. And, and we might start with 
some that are around the basic functionality of chat GPT. Um, one question that's coming in is, and this may, um, maybe this is an easy question to answer, maybe not, but I'm looking at Melanie and Kathy right now. Um, if two people enter in the same prompt or, or the same question, do they get exactly the same answer? <laughs> so um, I think the answer on that is not always. Um, but I think Melanie probably can say more. So Melanie, you want to respond? Yeah. Um, yeah, so they don't get the same answer. There is some, because the model is learning a probabil probability distribution over words, it's then also sampling from that distribution. So there is some um, randomness, some creativity that comes out in different responses to the same prompt. If it's a very short answer, like yes or no, then it will often be the same answer. So something like a math problem may be more similar than write a whole essay. Um, but there will tend to be similarities between different generations. So for example, I was having it write short stories about um, dogs dying. And in general, there were certain themes that were mentioned. So like the dog always died from illness. It was like dying in its owner's arms and was like the great companion of the owner. And so the, those, themes were repeated, but the wording was quite different in each case. So I would expect if you gave 30 students, like write an essay with the same prompt, the essays would be different, but there would be enough similarities that if that was human, human collaboration, you would kind of be like, okay, these students were working together. Like these are very similar in their topic. Okay, that's really useful. Thank you. Um, and Transitioning us slightly to, I think, what seemed to be a theme across all of our contributors' uh, presentations today, which is using this as a tool, thinking about in real time how we do this uh, responsibly with great curiosity um, and with a lot of responsibility to our students and the learning process. One thing that keeps coming up in a lot of the questions is, you know, to Victoria's point, ever since the advent of the internet. Um, and before, uh, we spent a lot of time helping students evaluate their sources um, and we primary sources, secondary sources, and this, this is no different, though, of course, the, the levers and lenses we use are different when we're thinking about digital literacy or information literacy. And so I'm imagining um, this is a question that we might still be working on answers to, but when we think about evaluating chat GPT, as a tool, and we think of it in terms of information or digital literacy, what are the most useful ways to evaluate ChatGPT as a tool that students might use? Um, and I'm thinking back to early days when Wikipedia first came on the scene and we were talking to students about, you know, is this something that is uh, valid? Do you, is this, you know, we want to cite our sources correctly. So I, I'm just curious um, and, I, I will open it to whoever would like to begin because I'd like to pitch it to who I think might have <laughs> an answer at the ready, but I'm not quite sure. So any thoughts on this? So I have some thoughts. I mean, we in um, the field of natural language processing, we spend time evaluating large language models, characterizing what they can do and what they can't do. So um, you know, we do have methods for how we can look at them and how we can understand them, especially since they're being developed, um, the large language models in industry, and we don't have access uh, to, to the inner workings of them. Um, I think, um, you know, there, there are uh, metrics that people have developed for testing how accurate the output is. So, so this would be one thing, certainly, um, you know, any, anyone who's using it as a tool has to be able to, as a person, evaluate what comes back. So they have to have enough knowledge to know whether what they're getting is correct or not um, and how to check it. Uh, I also think um, we, get some information from uh, people in uh, human computer interaction. So that's uh, Katie Garrow's work who did user studies on what works well. What do people find is helpful? So 
you know, as opposed to thinking about it to, you know, how do students find it helpful? We might think about it, how, how do people in the real world find it helpful? And for programming, in addition to writing, uh, there's a lot of evidence that, um, you know, people who, who are programming find it a very helpful tool to, you know, help them figure out what to do next. It's not always correct, but it can provide some clues or can often provide, you know, the, the full code. I can just add here, um, one of the things that I think we don't teach directly enough, often enough, is how do you become an informed person by virtue of the text you decide to have in your consciousness, whether that consciousness is actually in your own head or offloaded onto Zotero or some other kind of bibliographic software or elsewhere. And so if we began a practice in most classes that when students cite a text, one of the things that they do is follow up the citations they are using or being offered uh, to find the original, it does two things. It recontextualizes that source so that sometimes people will cite things and they don't actually look at the date. Um, and so to really understand how the world has changed from the moment at which the source was originally created to the current time. And then also to do some um, a simple highlighting exercise with any draft in which a quotation or a citation of a text appears to cross-reference it against how that same quotation exists in the original document. One of the things that that helps us to do is to follow up on amazing findings from the citation project by Becky Moore Howard and Sandra Jameson, which raises very, very interesting questions about how people use the text that they end up citing, including very expert uh, writers in final drafts. So I would do both those things. Thank you so much. So I'm going to transition us slightly, but it's, it's, not, um, it's not too much of a leap from the conversation we're having right now because a lot of what it comes down to is talking to students and engaging them in conversations about the tools that they use in their learning. Um, and so we have a question that came in and I think this might be a nice jumping off point for us, which is how instructors might begin talking to students about chat GPT or other AI tools more broadly and doing it in a way that doesn't assume that they will cheat but rather in a way that shows trust and respect for students. Are there any tips or pointers that any of us here might offer today? Um, and I, Victoria, would you like to take a first pass? Sure, <laughs> sure I would like to. Um, I think some of the best things to think about in any area, not even just inclusive of using chat GPT, but I think it's really important whenever you start a brand new class, you have new students in front of you with all kinds of different lived life experiences in, from international countries to various places around the US that they come to learn in your class, but they also come with their own assumptions about what's right and what's wrong and what they can and can't use. And so the best way to try to avoid confusion is from the get-go, from the first day of class when you're reviewing your policies and your syllabus, is really acknowledging your philosophy on academic integrity. Now, I don't think enough instructors think about it because I think a lot of us inherently assume, you know, Columbia students or just students in general, we don't want to assume that they'll take shortcuts or be cheaters or, you know, in their learning process. But oftentimes it's um, not just about that. And I see with my students who unfortunately make mistakes and, and do violate the policy, you know, it's bigger life issues that are controlling some of these quick decisions that they're making in the classroom around your assignments, right? They don't necessarily intend to be really dishonest or to one up you on, on creating, you know, um, a fake paper or um, misattributing a citation. Most often, more often than not, it is not their intention. But I think what's really important is to at every stage of the process that you learn and, and you're providing opportunities for them to learn, that you acknowledge those types of ex, external um, 
websites, sources, uh, companies that are frequently used and put them on your list of like, these are really good ones to use for supplementing your learning and name those, put them on your um, Canvas sites or your ex other uh, platforms that you're using as a point of tool discussion to make it super clear and direct them. These are the ones you can use versus uh, clarifying these are the other sources that you can't use. And it gets to Nicole's point about how do we teach students critically to know what's good sources? Similarly, what are good sources for supplemental like learning um, and making that clear? I think that's a simple way of just saying like, here's what I can, here's what I do want you to use. And here's what you can apply when you're using computer coding. I mean, in, the, in, in our computer science classes, we look at other companies, GitHub, Stack Overflow, you know, Chegg is sometimes used as a study aid or a tool, but you know, everything's in context, right? So you as the instructor have the ability to set the ground rules. If you allow that to be used in your classroom, then it's not technically a violation of the policy. But if, you, if you're not clear about it, then that's where confusion can be had, so. Yeah, thank you so much. Others, insights into how you might begin talking with students um, that comes from a place of partnership and transparency when it comes to using tools like this in the classroom? So I, I think one of the things um, that can be done is to um, have, a, have a session on it where you look at its output and you critique it. Um, so I had a class in the fall on these large language models for generation chat GPT came out at the end of that class, but we were talking about a lot of this throughout and we had a lot of discussion. Um, and I think you could do the same here, you know, even, even from the point of view of if I had them, you know, if I wanted them to write an essay and we compared, you know, we first discussed what could be produced by these chat GPT in response to an essay question, critiqued it, indicated what was wrong and asked them to do uh, their own, um, which was, did not have these issues that we had noted. I think students are pretty good about speaking up about, you know, what they think about things like this. Mm -hmm. I just want to sort of say that um, the since AI is learning and it will get better and better, the, the uh, extrinsic reason for uh, not using it, I think gets lower and lower. Like, oh, look, it's doing pretty good work or good enough or better than what I think I could produce. So that's not a good enough reason, at least in my classroom. Um, I, at some point, I'm not gonna be able to sort of critique it enough to my satisfaction. So instead, I want to be working with students from the first day of class as you do for always um, on intrinsic reasons why learning to do, in my case, writing, um, what is the cognitive effects? What are the social effects? What are the ethical effects? And by ethics, I mean here, not only like you won't violate the policy, but what are the things in which you get to participate in the world through the work that you do when you do it um, at some points without AI, without AI support. And so I can only dramatize that not by having a single session, not by having it loudly and in bold on my syllabus, although I think actually all those things are good ideas. I think instead it has to be part of the daily practice of class. So if I believe that writing is a technology for thought, human thought, as well as AI thought, then I want to honor that fact by centering writing as the practice in which we do the work of our class, not just because it's a writing class. In fact, it may be even more important in classes where writing is not the subject of study, but uh, a dimension of what we're asking students to do. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, 
Yeah, I imagine that these conversations, well, I know that these conversations will continue to evolve. Uh, indeed, the conversations that we've had since the launch of ChatGPT in November, I mean, dramatically different today, even 10 days ago. Uh, I feel like we were having different sorts of conversations, but across the board in every conversation I've had the privilege of being a part of, it's, you know, talk to your students, um, pay attention and make sure that you're making your policies and expectations, your goals for learning very clear. Um, and as we learn more, I can imagine too, that there will be greater guidance, um, greater discussions of how we approach this in higher ed more broadly, disciplinarily. Um, and it's just, it's such a new conversation that especially at the forefront of it, at this point, thinking about these things is It'll be even at the end of the semester, we might have use cases that we don't have the privilege of having uh, right now. So I appreciate you all sort of thinking forward uh, or reflecting forward as, as you think through like how this might go in a classroom. Um, I have, this might be our final question and my apologies to the many questions that we haven't had a chance um, to answer today. But when we think about, um, using chat GPT or more broadly AI tools in the classroom in a way that serves us pedagogically, um, creative examples of folks who might be incorporating this into their classroom and working with students in that capacity. I'm thinking um, a couple of weeks ago, there was an article in the New York Times of an instructor who require, is requiring the semester, all of his students to put their papers through ChatGPT first and then come to class and see what they do with them next. And I'm not advocating for that. I'm just saying that it's, it's out there and, and certainly something that folks have been talking about. So, are there ways that we this this uh, ChatGPT could serve us pedagogically and and help us? Uh, I don't want to use the term level up, but um, think about exciting ways to engage students with these types of tools. Nicole, I see you nodding and smiling, so I'm tempted to call on you for your active your active listening. <laughs> it's it's um I don't know it's a habit. Um, yes, yes. Uh, it's about generating, right? So two things we can, we can, bye Kathy. Uh, Thank you so much for joining us. So one of the things that people feel stuck on a lot of the time is where to start, right? Um, and there are a lot of different where to start kinds of technologies out there. Now, um, someone I think in the chat was asking, if not for writing, then what about research? There is AI that helps us with that now. It's, and one of the platforms I know of is called Research Rabbit um, that will go and, and say, basically, if you liked this paper, then you'll love these papers, which you may or may not, but okay. Um, and so uh, I, I don't wanna also get too stuck on chat GPT because so many other things are starting to come down the pike, but I think it's about our orientation toward all. So that's one part. Second part, at least again, for, for my purposes, but I imagine may be true in other contexts, is giving us a strong sense of genre. So genre, not as a set of conventions that get um, uh, just, just repeated endlessly, uh, but as a, what in, in rhetorical genre studies, um, and I, I'd have people look at the work of Anis Bawarshi and Mary Jo Reef, among many others, who let us know, building on uh, Carolyn Miller's work, that genre is a social action. And so if we think about that, then uh, in that way, sort of in the wonderful work that Alexandria Lockett and others have done on Wikipedia, um, it can be a site of exchange. It can be a site of activism, in fact. Um, I thought I saw a comment from Wayne Lee in the, in the comments asking about creating new platforms from AI. And I, I, I wonder about that. Um, how might we consider it as a, a way to, to create a model of co-construction of knowledge that we then could bring to classrooms um, rather than defend classrooms from? Yeah, thank you. Melanie or Victoria, other exciting ways that you imagine this technology might be incorporated into classrooms and pedagogy? Yeah. Um... I think the, so the link that Kathy and I had on our last slide also has some 
ideas uh, that I think will continue to be updated. Um, but some of the things are, it can also be helpful for just like lesson planning and developing materials as an instructor, because it can be an idea generator on that side, as well as for developing like assessment questions. Um, and people have also used it to personalize materials to students too, if there is, um, which could be relevant, more relevant at sort of like a younger education level, but there is potential to be able to personalize stuff here. Um, there's also potential to use it as more of a individualized tutor or for students to experiment with it in that way to ask questions um, to ChatGPT and use that as kind of a collaborative study aid to, to test their own understanding and get a deeper explanation for different things. Uh, and yeah, I think definitely like, yeah, maybe you're able to take on a more complex assignment if you're using it as sort of this um, collaborator in the same way that if you work in pairs on an assignment, you can um, take on something more interesting. So uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of cool things to explore there. Thank you. Yes, I, I like, uh, I've asked it quite a few times, like ask me five questions about this very nuanced piece of my discipline. And I'm always surprised by the questions that asks me. And I think, gosh, that would be interesting to incorporate into an assignment. Mm -hmm. um, Victoria, any closing thoughts? We we wrap up in about 45 seconds. So you can also take a pass if you'd like. Well, I mean, I just think this is an important conversation to just keep discussing and talking yeah. about that, you know, today we didn't answer all the questions. And I, I just wanna encourage people who may be more on the side of the policing end of, of chat GPT that to recognize that here, at least at Columbia, you have resources you can connect with myself. You can also connect with our Center for Student Success and Intervention, which um, houses our student conduct um, unit. And they're the ones that actually investigate cases of dishonesty. So you're more than welcome to always pick the brain, talk about a scenario, you know, you do not have to report as a faculty member, but we encourage um, if you're ever just questioning, your gut tells you something, you know, it can't hurt to give us a call and get a sense of what happens next and understand the process. Because I know that this is always in matters of thinking about how do we want to encourage students to teach and learn and grow, like it's important to consult. And so we encourage you to consult with us um, to make the best decision for your own um, level of instruction and pedagogy and to learn from every opportunity that you have around matters that intersect on this. It's it's a gray issue in academia, so there's never straightforward answers. And so I, that's why I encourage you to, to reach out and uh, encourage anyone here if they want to, if they enjoyed today's conversation, a shameless plug for Integrity Week coming up. So hope you can join us. Thank you so much. Um, I'll ask one of my colleagues to drop into the chat a promoting academic integrity resource that the Center for Teaching and Learning developed in collaboration with Victoria. It's got some great resources in there. Um, and thank you all for joining us. Thank you again to all of our contributors for sharing your expertise and joining us for this emerging conversation where we have many more questions than answers at this point. To Victoria's excellent point, this will not be the last conversation we have about this, I am sure. So please stay tuned and have a wonderful Monday, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.